Oh, uh, thanks for coming tonight, and you know, thanks for having us, um, Transition Bondi. It's um, really lovely of you. It's a really, it's a great venue, and you know, and all the people who put on the food, and the, you know, it's a great, I guess, collaborative effort, and all the introductions at the start is a sort of, I guess, gave uh, you know, it's a great sense of um, community, and so um, you know, which is, I guess, really. What this is all about is, um, you know, your human community, your natural community, um, your integrated systems within the actual building itself. And really, I guess all it's about is embracing that um, collective unity. So I guess I'll talk a little bit about myself to begin with, because I'm an egomaniac. And um, <laughs> my name's Dovi. Uh, I live in Nimbin, and I'm um, or just outside of Nimbin, you know, whatever. <laughs> and um, I'm part of a building organisation, a collective, whatnot, um, called Terrain and Biotecture, which is um, made up of, I guess, a union of the two words Terra and Eden. So you got Terra, which is the Latin word for planet Earth, and Eden, which is a uh, home of the immortal. So you got Earth home for the immortal, and that's basically what we're going for. It's not about, I guess, you know. Sustainability is nice, but I guess what we're trying to do is add to the four billion years of planetary evolution and evolve those systems and that sort of thing. And part of a collective beyond that called Levity Foundation, which um, incorporates integrated agricultural systems and, um, you know, alchemy and whatnot. <laughs> so, um, what are we talking about here tonight? Earthships. <laughs> So, um, uh, I was building with Michael Reynolds at the Academy with um, 30 other people from like, you know, vast different backgrounds. Um, I guess I come from a hospitality entrepreneur type background. There were people there that were students and, um, you know, uh, there was a fisherman and a whole bunch of different people. And I guess the whole thing that I learned from the Academy is that really anyone can do this so it's um you know bees and wasps build their own house so us human beings with all these amazing cognitive abilities you know should be able to um you know sh uh, shit it in for the lack of a better expression <laughs> and so um what we did here was took the technology learnt in new mexico adapted it to the subtropical uh, climate of Queensland, where we were. There's a secret location, so I can't tell you exactly because it wasn't, a, you know, it wasn't exactly what you would call uh, legal type thing. <laughs> so, um, but that's fine. It was, um, I guess it was uh, legal in the eye of the universe or whatever justification you want to give it. And so, um, what we did was we took those um, systems that I learned in New Mexico, we adapted it to that climate in Queensland, we incorporated hempcrete, we focused a lot on drainage and uh, airflow because there's a lot of humidity and we also focused a lot on intention. So it's really important, like if you're going to build like this, it's great to know where the screws and nails go, but it's even more important in my opinion to know why the screws and nails are going there, why you're facing the building that way and where the understanding has to come from. And so, whoa, that shake a little. <laughs> so we um, set it up, I guess, as a workshop where um, I met this couple, uh, Bob and Shelley in Nimbin and they said they wanted to build an earth ship. I'm like, yeah, sure, everyone does, but they wanted to do it like next week. So I was like, all right, cool. So um, they sort of, I guess, uh, supplied the materials and that sort of thing. And my side of it was I'd organize the workforce. And so that has opened up an opportunity to, um, you know, educate. That's the word. And so we put it out on the Earthship website. We had 60 people apply for the workshop on the, on the first day. And then by the time the build started, we had over 450 applicants. And um, we were asking, uh, asking, <laughs> asking, sorry, I had a whiskey before. Um, <laughs> we were um, 
asking the um, applicants to answer questions like, um, you know, what does community mean to you? Um, uh, how would you define love and its role in everyday life? Uh, you know, what are you going to use, you know, this uh, information for? So they weren't, I guess, regular questions you'd expect to be asked on a build, you know, type thing. Usually it's like, you know, are you a mammal? Do you breathe or whatever? <laughs> and so, um, you know, basically what we were trying to do with that was um, we were trying to get a, cr a crew that was aligned in intention. So to get that intention, which was truth and love, I guess, <laughs> and um, put that into a tangible application, which is the build, to see how that, I guess, intention um, affects the actual functionality of the living space. So it was great and it actually worked, which was cool. I had you know, a kind of inclination because I asked a tree before I, met, uh, before I left Nimbin and they said it was going to work. So. And it did. It was great. Everyone, it was a very tight crew from the beginning. Um, uh, David and Katie around here somewhere, they were on the build. And, um, well, they might have left. You know, I would too. Oh, there they are. <laughs> That's David and Katie. They were on the build. And, um, you know, and it was great. We had a lot of fun. You know, there was a lot of laughter. And there was a lot of, you know, a lot of the base level communication stuff was irrelevant as soon as you know people turned up everyone already felt like they were connected on such a, on quite a i guess a deeper level which made for a harmonious workspace and um all right let's get into this so that was um that was actually the introduction day so we had all of our lessons and lectures in there so that was just a basic camp kitchen on site dusty Queenland, uh, Queensland yes, landscape and um, you know so that's everyone on site I guess explaining how the cooling tube works there and um, as you can see everyone's engaged by you know someone's sniffing their armpit and other one's talking <laughs> over there <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was a really it was a really great crew and so what we were going for was like a Cogno Cairo sort of working environment, so like brain and, uh, and hands. So I guess you had your intention, which was like, I guess, your heart space or your intuition or whatever you want to call it, um, which was uh, communicated through head, which was the lectures, and which was applied through hand. So it was like, I guess, a trinity of learning. And yeah, it was really, you know, it was hard slogging. I, you know, I remember, um, you know, you were doing really good on the tire pounding, and so, so were you. you were, you were given it, <laughs> but um, it was there was a lot of hard labour, but it was um, you know it was just quite satisfying and it was um, like the the atmosphere was just electric every day. It was fantastic, and um, you know we had a Friday fun days. <laughs> that was the day everyone got dressed up as um, transvestites and went to um, the local lawn bowls. So <laughs> it was a, you know in this dusty country sort of Queensland town like you know everyone's related and share teeth and that sort of thing. <laughs> and so um, you know and then these guys were rocking up. So you know I think they'll probably still be talking about it for decades to come. So this is a movie by Michael Reynolds, a little one. This is action, this is activity. We, a bunch of us, are doing this, doing this in a community. We're stretching every limit of the law, pushing everything to be able to do this. We will talk while we're doing it, but we will not stop doing it. We will not stop. Yes, I want to do what we're doing. We're building buildings. We're finding pockets of freedom. We're struggling for permits. We're improving buildings. We have started a carbon zero subdivision. We are starting villages that are carbon zero. I, I dug in my heels much deeper because of Copenhagen. We took in the American Revolution 12-year-old kids and put rakes and shovels and hoes in their hands as weapons and said fight. People were brave back then. They saw the problem. The British were coming. Well now, the fire is coming. Global warming is coming. Polluted waters are coming. Polluted air is coming. CO2 is coming. Plastic is floating in the oceans. I mean, 
It is time to put a rake in the hands of a 12-year-old and take a few risks. The best thing I can say that was said to me by an engineer that went through this building, he didn't say a word as I was explaining everything. Finally, when I got done, he said, what the world needs now is one billion of these immediately. It's okay to clap. <laughs> There we go. So I guess my hidden agenda to get you all here tonight is um, I'm trying to recruit militia. <laughs> That's all right, lock the doors. <laughs> um, so basically um, our organization is um, going around. We've got four builds coming up within the next 12 months, all the way from here to Vanuatu to the Philippines. And um, we're looking for people who have got skills, people who are interested in getting skills, and basically anyone who's willing to sort of, I guess, engage into the future. I've got a pen and paper there, so um, feel free to jot down your name and your details at the end. But um, so that brings us to biotechture. So I guess the need for biotechture is quite obvious. We're living in quite a separated um, society where we've got a truck in uh, power and frack and food mileage and all the kinds of things that everyone here knows about and um, it's really living in a kind of solitary sort of uh, I guess existence where you're building houses to shelter you from the rain to keep you warm to keep you fed, to keep you sustained. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I guess what we're trying to move into is, uh, I guess, a collective consciousness in relation to habitat and sustenance. So you're engaging with sun path, you're engaging with rain trends, you're engaging with your, you know, your nourishment, with your waste. It's a really that's like one of the keys that is sort of like disconnecting us as a species to the planet is our waste because we don't want to deal with that part of the cycle. We don't want to deal with rubbish. We don't want to deal with poo. We don't want to deal with death. And that's all that end part of the cycle which is essential for the rebirth. So we need to engage with our poo. We need to engage with our waste and our uh, rubbish so we can <laughs> move on, I guess, to the next step of evolution. And that's Earthships, pretty much. <laughs> so, Earth phenomena. Uh, what do we got here? Wind, rain, sun, gravity, condensation, thermal mass, lightning, rainbows. Yep, <laughs> engaging with rainbows. Um, all aspects of biology. I, I think we, we'll see if we can find out how we're engaging with rainbows. Um, all, all aspects of biology and physics. And um, all of these things as an integrated system. So there's no, I guess, real separation in their existence. So this is what Earth ships are modelled of, which is a tree which, in, in my opinion, is one of the most highly evolved beings on the planet. It's nailed integrated systems, it's nailed its own sustenance and its water management and its waste management. The tree knows shit, <laughs> pretty much. Um, there we go. It's encountering a rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a, you know, this is right in the middle of the desert. There's no power lines anywhere nearby. There's no water. They get seven inches of rainfall a year. Um, they've got plants growing, lights going. It's comfortable. It stays at about 21 degrees Celsius all year round without any heating and cooling. No fire, no fossil fuels, no fracking. That's a kitchen if you want to make a cup of tea or whatnot. <laughs> so decentralization is what we're talking about. So I guess being little I guess, um, I don't know, how could you explain it? Being like a, a nipple on the breast of the planet, I guess is how I like to describe it. So instead of, you know, pulling things in from all over the place, you're encountering it in, in a um, decentralized manner. So, you know, your, uh, your sun path, rain trends, all that. 
So these are the six main living systems that make up an earth ship. Uh, building with natural and recycled materials, thermal solar heating and cooling, solar and wind electricity, water harvesting, contained sewage treatment, and food production. And so all of these happen in an integrated manner. Uh, one can't exist without the other. Mike has a saying, which is it's similar to the human body, where um, you know, you've got your uh, respiratory system, digestive system, nervous system, all of the systems operate in integration and one can't exist without the other and that is what creates the human form. And I guess it's the human spirit that brings all that to life. Same as with an Earthship, it's the human interaction with the Earthship that brings it to life and makes all the systems work in harmony with, um, uh, what do you call it, Earth phenomena. So building with natural and recycled materials. <coughs> this, I guess, um, Mike's got another saying. He's got so many sayings. <laughs> and, um, which is, um, you know, if you can't use a byproduct, don't use a product. So, which is, you know, that's totally, um, engaging that last part of the cycle and it's direct recycling it's not you know putting it in a recycling bin and then they truck it over there and then they process it then they truck it over there then it goes in a boat to India put in a dump and so not that kind of recycling <laughs> like recycling like you drink a bottle you put it in a sludge and build a house out of it <laughs> that kind of recycling which is cool and you've got natural materials as well so it acts almost as a timeline where um You've got these, you know, soil and sand and all of these things that planet Earth has taken four billion years to develop. You're engaging that with the byproducts of society. So you've got the two worlds meeting, which is cool. I like it when they hang out. So <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> so I've got um, uh, tires. So I guess if you were an alien coming down to planet Earth and you were to see all the tires, you'd probably be under the assumption that they grow on this planet naturally because there's, there's that many of them. <laughs> and they're such a fantastic thing to use. It's so low skills required. It's, you know, you pound them and they're like a three, uh, uh, 125 kilo building block that's, um, you know, heat, uh, you know, fireproof. It becomes earthquake resistant, pest proof. And, um, you know, it's just an amazing, you know, it's, this, um, it's like a heating system and a cooling system. And so, you know, there's dumps all over the world like that, but, you know, you don't usually see them quite like this. Wow. <laughs> that's a real place. That's not like Photoshop, you know, by some guy in Japan. That's actually a place. That's in, um, uh, where's that? That's in California. But um, it's quite like, you know, I get kind of, Tingles looking at that, you know, you could build cities out of that. <laughs> Look at the potential. <laughs> it's, um, it's great. You've got these big ones down here you can make septic tanks out of, and it's great. You know, those guys are walking down there, they're a bit lost, but, you know, it's okay. It's, you know, there's always time. That's a tire fire, you know, in case you couldn't conceptualize smoke. That's what it looks like when things are on fire. <laughs> and um, that's an uncontrollable fire too, the, that fire truck's there, as soon as those gases are flying around with the air and they ignite, it's like, you know, he's going to be eating a Dorito or something, waiting for that to blow over because he's not going to be able to put that out. And yeah, that's them in their application, you know, look at that, that's a proper building site, look at the string line, so it's, <laughs> that, that, that works. And so you see they're pounded, they're level. They're on a string line, so they're going up as a straight wall. It's just um, so, such an easy thing. And once that's totally encased on one side and rendered on the other side with a vapor barrier, that's not going anywhere for a long time. Future species are going to come to planet Earth when we're all dead, and they'll sort of say, you know, they'll think it's a church or something and, you know, hail the tire. <laughs> <laughs> That's the tire pounding process. So you got tires, you, you put a bit of cardboard in there so the dirt doesn't fall through. Jamie Lee's done a few of these, I've, seen, I've witnessed that. <laughs> and you uh, put your dirt in, you kick it in, slam it in, and you got yourself a building block. So to do this on your own, 
would take a very long time. There's a lady called Kirsten in New Mexico who's like Mike's right hand man, woo man type thing. And um, she did it by herself and it took her, I think it was like five or six years until the building was done. So the importance of building in community is really important, and like time frame as well. You know, we did all the tire work in four days in um, uh, Queensland. Is that true? Am I exaggerating? Exaggerating? It was like three months. <laughs> no, it was about a week, something like that. We had a cyclone though, come on. <laughs> um, so that's how it looks as a finished wall. You got your tires, it's packed out. It's trailed over with a finished wall, so you know it can be cob, a cementitious product, which is a bit yucky. But um, we're going to hopefully be doing it in a hempcrete render, because in um, uh, subtropical areas, it's really good to use hempcrete because it absorbs moisture and releases moisture. So you don't get stagnant moisture, which creates mold, uh, with I guess relationship to the cooling tube as well. So yeah, that's the way. What are those white? They're cans. So what they do is they pack it out, they put the cans in, and the reason why they do that is so you use less material and you also get to use the, the can. And so, um, yeah, so you're basically using all of the waste that you can in any application possible. Um, that's what one of the, that's actually Dennis Weaver's house, I'm pretty sure. I base that on nothing, but I'm pretty sure it is. And um, so you see, like, creatively, you've got no limitations. Your only limitations is your own creativity, what your land wants, your environmental restrictions, your uh, monetary restrictions, and legal restrictions if you care to acknowledge them. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, I guess, all of the, um, the main recycled materials in one picture. You've got your tires, you've got your cans, you've got your bottles, and the strength in those walls, these walls, there's no timber bracing. There's a timber thing there for the doorway, but on all the other sides, there's no timber bracing. The strength in that wall is in the honeycomb matrix around the bottles and around the cans. And um, so I guess that pattern comes up a lot in nature, like obviously with your honeycombs, you cut open a bit of bamboo and you look at the grain and you've got that same pattern. It turns up all over the place. And um, so yeah, that's, and that, that's really cool. You can punch out all of those bottles and all those cans and that wall's still gonna stay there. So yeah, so it's form work. You don't have to use as much cement or cob or whatever you're using. Bottles. There's a lot of bottles in that picture. <laughs> and, you know, build your house with it. A lot of 10 senses, that's right, you know. So this is um, stained glass bottle bricks. And what happens here is the bottles cut on one end, you measure out your wall and it's got a clear bottle on the other end, it's gaffer taped, put in a sludge. And then when the sunlight shines through it, it illuminates on the other side and you can get some really beautiful patterns and artwork out of it. Uh, click. That's a, you know, another one of that. <laughs> so that's a guy with a, uh, with a level. <laughs> so, you know, everything's done, I guess, properly. He was um, shown how to do this wall sort of just before this photo was taken. And so, you know, it's really simple uh, skills that really anyone can learn. If you can get a handful of goop and put a bottle in it, you can pretty much build one of these things. He's level-headed, yeah. And that's that, that lady was also, you know, she's doing some pretty cool shapes there. And, um, you know, she was only shown that that day. And, um, you know, this is uh, before I went up to New Mexico, but Mike said that, so I'm gonna believe it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you can get heaps of different shapes. All that is is, you know, reinforced steel with goop and bottles. You know, boom shakalaka, <gasps> and there's uh, tires on the other side of that I'm pretty sure. You can look fairly conservative. So this is Kirsten's house. This is that house the lady built. It took her five or six years. So she's used just clear bottles and so it doesn't have to look wacko but um, you know I kind of like it when it does. See look at that. That's where all the strength is. Just throughout there. 
And um, you know, some places there's plastic bottles where you don't have glass bottles. You can get a whole new different, you're in, entering into a whole new different realm of creativity. So you're getting cool sort of shapes like that. All that is is bottoms of bottles. And so, um, you know, and then you don't have to worry about them sitting and leaching in, um, you know, dumps. You know, you put a bottle on either end and you get light coming through. It's cool. And you got roofing from um, reclaimed metal, like white goods, car doors, all that sort of thing. And like, it's just sitting in the dumps. Like you always, you'll go to a tip and they've always got heaps of fridges, heaps of washing machines and that sort of thing. And so, you know, they just sit there because they don't, I don't know, they can't dump them or something. I don't know what it is, but yeah, take it, build a roof out of it, it's free. You know, they cut them, they um, seal the bits where they cut so they don't rust and they just apply them like they would shingles. You know, that's the top of a um, linseed oil can with a penny. So, you know, it really just, um, you start to look at the world in a different way. You look at it instead of a whole bunch of rubbish, you look at it as potential. So this is um, in the Phoenix Earth ship. It's a really upmarket Earth ship, I guess. Um, that uh, bathtub's made out of cans and, and mortar, and then you've got all your bottle bricks, and you know, it's essentially, it's a luxury home built out of rubbish, you know? <laughs> like the house that you have to drink to exist. <laughs> that's Shelley, that's a lady who um, we build the house for, and um, so what's happening there is we've got our can wall, we've got our hemp roof, you can see the corner of it there, and all of that void space in there, we're chucking all the trash from the build. Or everyone's crap, we threw it in there, except for the stuff that is perishable, like food and, and that sort of the stuff that, that you, you know, that's compostable. Everything else we chucked in there, and then we walked away with you know, very little rubbish at the end of the build. So there's, you know, you're not left with a whole bunch of crap, pretty much. That's Ian, he's, um, he's another guy on the crew. And um, he's basically, I guess, our um, structural engineer. Like we dream up stuff and he makes it happen in a reality because you know, he's, that's the way he rolls. And so all of that is um, styrofoam from like, you know, the good guys, a whole bunch of different places in the nearest local town. <laughs> and um, we went driving through there, jumping into their bins and that sort of thing. And, we use it as insulation, which we ended up finding out we didn't actually even need it for insulation because when we did those hemp roofs and the hemp roof set, it was like a 40 degree day and you could touch the top of the roof and it was so hot. And you went underneath to the, uh, what's that thing called, the ceiling? <laughs> and um, you touched the ceiling and it was cold. So there's absolutely no transfer of heat. So it's, it's a highly insulative, highly you know strong it's like a, it becomes crystallized like a full-on masonry very strong that's us mixing up the hemp and um, as you can see it's um, for a natural material it was quite toxic to work with the binder the binder is a lime based binder I'm pretty sure it has magnesium and a whole bunch of other stuff in it but the recipe is held secret the, <laughs> the lady who um, the lady who we got it off, um, she, you know, it's kind of like that's what she makes her money off, so she didn't tell us the thing, but it worked. So I'm going to show you guys a stop motion now of us doing the second roof. So um, this is us doing the second roof. You can see off to the side there, we're mixing, constantly mixing, constantly mixing. They're bringing barrows up, they're applying it onto the roof, troweling it, really simple. and. Having a whole bunch of people on site made it a lot easier because it was just like this flow of work. It was incredible. As you can see, we're working really quick that day. <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting stuck into the, you know, uh, the cola nut or whatever. <laughs> the guarana. You know, a little bit of oxygen. But, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, that's how we did it. So um, thanks for coming. <laughs> this here is um, you've got the hemp roof, you've got the bottle wall, and you've got all the rubbish 
underneath this, that was um, soil, and it's shaped so the water can tear down here and get caught into, uh, I guess, a water catchment thing that goes to the water tank. And what's happening up there, we've got a whole bunch of PVC, and so we've made skylights in the shape of the Phoenix constellation, because, you know, from Nimbin and that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so yeah, it was, it was really cool, and that ended up being covered over the roof cap, and it was lovely. So, and actually, what we worked out is that the part of the day that the sun comes over that, the Phoenix constellation is on the exact opposite part of the planet. Uh, yeah. at that particular time. So that's cool. That's me being checking out, you know, the hemp archway with the bottles. So, you know, deep in thought. And um, there was actually no thought going on. It was just absolute silence up there. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just really, it's, it's really malleable. You can use it to a whole bunch of different applications. Um, that's basically reinforced steel with hemp smashed in there. We stuck a bottle in it, and so at night time when they have the lights on, the colour of the bottle comes through either end, and it's just a really pretty thing. So thermal solar heating and cooling. Um, I guess in Australia, about, I think it's like 46% or something like that of our residential energy consumption is in heating and cooling space. So this technology completely annihilates that. You don't have to worry about it through convection, through uh, the relationship between convection and thermal mass. You don't have to do any sort of heating and cooling. It does it itself, obviously, with your interaction. And how that happens is this line here is the frost line or the temperature line, whatever you want to call it. That's like the floor line where all exterior weather and temperature hits. In your conventional house, you build on top of your temperature line and then you bring other things, other external things in to keep you warm and cool and that sort of stuff, your split system, air conditioning, your frack wells and whatever you want to use. Um, so what we're doing is we're kind of tapping in to that temperature, that earth temperature, which is roughly about 14.5 degrees. And anything that really happens out here is redirected over the roof and so you're not really affected by it and you're um, orientating your house so you're catching your winter sun so your winter sun comes all the way through and stores in your tires packed with the earth and is released back out when the temperature drops in the room so um, it's a really simple easy smart like people have been building like that you know before we had the um, obstacle of television and whatnot to for us to unlearn all this sort of shit um, so yeah, that's a winter sun coming through, you know, proof, right there. <laughs> and um, this is in New Mexico, that is, that's the lounge room. So you know what I mean? The oxygen in these places are incredible. You walk in and it's like walking into a rainforest. And it's like birds and, you know, and wasps and, you know, all that. I love that sort of stuff, but you know, I guess, choose your own adventure. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's beautiful, it regulates itself. This is a convection skylight. So this is the natural, I guess, air conditioning. And you open up your cooling tubes on either end, open up your skylight, and then boom. <laughs> Hot air comes out. That's what the, that's what the thing says. Um, that's underneath. That's the comfort zone. So that's basically the woman that we're trying to woo, is a comfort zone. We're trying to get her comfortable. We're feeding her with sunlight. We're feeding her with convection air from the, uh, you know, from the earth berm. And so that's what we're tapping into. Um, that's a winter sun coming in, you know, heating up the comfort zone. And so, as you can see here, your winter sun is coming in. It's heating up the. Ooh, it's heating up the mass of the tires, the floor mass, and that's getting extracted back out when the temperature drops in the room. If you're living in a really cold climate, you've got your buffer zone here. So if you have a really cold day, it has to get through that buffer zone before it affects your comfort zone. In Australia, most of Australia, not including the desert and um, Melbourne, 
you um, don't uh, you don't really need I guess a buffer zone I wouldn't even get one for here um, you've got secondary buffer zone if you're somewhere like um, you know Oslo Sweden or whatever so um, yeah so basically you're trying to when you're doing your house design you're trying to make sure this area here has got as much of a consistent temperature as possible and so what that involves is living on your land learning about your land and your local environment and what that requires and wants and that's what's going to shape your house that's your oh okay boom <laughs> that's your um that's your convection so you have a pipe that goes all the way from the inside of the room through the tires back through the earth boom and out into the uh, sky or the, the um, wait no it's too low to be the sky isn't it we were talking about this earlier um, the air and um, because this is the hottest place in the house where the skylight is in this area so you open up your cooling tubes you open up your um, convection skylight and then that is just going to pull all that through like boom And um, yeah, if, you have, if, if your house gets really hot and you have that going, you can avoid um, any extra sort of um, solar gain that's unnecessary. Solar, I guess thermal mass is kind of like a piggy bank that you rob every day to get candy. So you're, you're, you're feeding your piggy bank in incremental amounts, five cents here, 10 cents there. And then, but then you're taking it out and you're buying candy. And so what you're aiming for is eventually putting more money in than you can ap have an appetite for candy. So that's basically how an Earthship works. <laughs> um, this is us putting the cooling tube in, PVC pipe that we found, chicken wire, and we put in uh, like a five to one cement mortar with rocks, so we didn't have to use as much cement. That's uh, Henry, <laughs> I was about to say his real name, but we got kids. Um, uh, Jesse and Kate. <laughs> um, what was the moral of that story? Yeah, cooling tube. So that's what happens when it's immersed in cement and that gets buried behind. And so it goes, because this is a hill, uh, sorry, this is a hill <laughs> behind here. And so we didn't go all the way back because there's no sky for it to catch. So we sent it all the way around the house uh, laid it in sand, buried it, and so that was just a totally, um, you know, cool air system. And it works out, you know, like half the price of a split system air conditioning and you're not, you know, raping the planet and whatnot. So it's cool. It's all positives. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Solar and wind electricity. So don't have to limit yourself to solar and wind. This is just, I guess, basically, it's something that legislators can understand. It's like, if you're building somewhere, I guess, like in Sydney or whatnot, you want to, I guess, give them something they can understand. Like, you know, you wouldn't give, uh, you know, a, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't give a dog a boot to eat. I guess, okay, bad example. <laughs> you you want to give the legislators something that, they were, something that they understand. So solar and wind is usually the easiest thing. Michael Reynolds has this thing, it's like, um, you know, if you want to feed a dog a pill, you don't shove the pill down a dog's throat. You wrap it in some sausage meat and the dog woofs it up. So the dog understands the sausage meat, but it gets a pill at the same time. So this is how you want to treat your council. <laughs> you know, you want to wrap it up in a nice little thing they understand. And then when they, they accept your sausage meat, they're also accepting a little bit of understanding and nutrition. Solar panels. <laughs> So um, it's been said that learning to make fire is the most important point in human history and humans promptly began burning everything on the planet. The next most, uh, <laughs> the next most important point. point in human history will be learning not to need fire. And that's what we're tapping into. The trees are not there for us to make nice little houses out of. The trees are serving a higher purpose on this planet we don't need to cut them down to burn them and to create fuel and all that sort of stuff. It all exists in all of that phenomena that we've been talking about. And that's why we use solar panels. 
And, um, you know, there's so many different things. There's hydroelectric, there's tromp systems. There's, it's all about learning what your land wants. If you have a lot of sun, you use your solar panels. You know, if you're in a high wind area, you use your wind. Or if you have a running stream, you can do your hydroelectric. If you want to be really passionate and, you know, experiment with like some, um, what's that guy's name? The one that they all talk about, the free energy, Nicholas Tesla. You know, you can do whatever you want, really. It's your life. Um, so that's where a lot of our en energy consumption happens. And so with an earth ship, you can really cut out most of that. All you're trying to power is uh, lighting, you know, and appliances, pretty much. You've got all of your pumps have their own solar panel. Um, it's, it's really, you know, the one we did in New Mexico, the entire power system costs less than $500. Just a little panel, little con uh, charge controller, little inverter, little batteries, just a whole... You carry it in a red, uh, not briefcase, toolbox. That's actually the house I lived in, in New Mexico. And um, it didn't have anywhere near that many solar panels when I was living in it. Because the guy who built this with Michael Reynolds totally went off concept, got really greedy, wanted to live in like a theme park, water, wonderland, whatever. And so it was a really beautiful house, but it didn't function. The sewage pipes froze up and the whole place smelled like shit. But, you know, Mike bought the house back off them for, I think it was something like 700 grand, something retardedly cheap. And the guy had cost him $7 million to build it. So, um, you know, it's really important to listen to your land. That's the world's largest solar radio station. Just runs off solar. All the DJ equipment, all the everything, whatever it is, runs straight off the solar panels in a standalone system. You know, you've seen solar panels before. They run to a deep, this is how an off-grid system works. It runs to a deep cycled uh, batteries. Uh, before that, actually, it goes to the charge controller, which goes to the deep cycle batteries which is, you know, you've got your direct current, which can be like your LCD lights or whatever. Um, you know, then you've got your inverter to translate that direct current into alternate current. So you can power, um, you know, appliances and televisions or whatever you want to do. And the brain is just an Earthship way of saying switchboard. <laughs> just a brain. Brain on drugs. And so, yeah, there you go. There's a proof. It lights up the lights. And um, you're totally self-contained. You know when you turn off that light switch, it's not coming from the Hunter Valley. Uh, it's not coming from wherever you guys have your um, coal-fired power stations. This is the granddaddy of Earth ships. It's the first one. I'm pretty sure I base this again on whim. But um, I'm pretty sure this is the first one that integrated all those systems. That, um, what do you call it, that wind turbine blue for 20 years didn't create a lot of power but it didn't break and i think it eventually broke but it was a very long time afterwards you know you got your uh horizontal axis wind turbines which you know stuff up every 18 months mike used to climb on to that you know club pigeons bring them down skin them and eat them really encountering his local environment <laughs> he's basically like a um, a redneck who really understands natural cycles, natural system, and is in touch with collective consciousness. In a nutshell, they're not always like, you know, flowy robe hippies. <laughs> this is another one that blew for 20 years. They had to build a house around it because it was generating so much electricity, it was gonna launch and lift off the ground. <laughs> so they had to build the house around it to um, keep it from flying away. Uh, that's another one I lived in. That's a really beautiful house. It's just, that's all cans and mortar. It's like, they called it the castle. So that's that. Uh, it's a cool house. That's right in the middle of the desert. You know. Water harvesting. So, moving away from your fluoridated water, you're uh, collecting rainwater. They only get seven inches of rainfall a year. So, there's really no excuse for us to um, run out of water and you know in Nimbin they uh, last year it was like um, 91 I think it was 91 inches of rainfall or something like that and people were trucking in water and dry season it's because it's not um, 
I guess uh, it's not getting utilized and reused probably in earth ships they get the water gets reused four times so the same water we were living in one in the middle of the desert and we never ran out of water and that's on seven inches of rainfall so boobs <laughs> so that's what I think whenever I see that <laughs> so it's like the the um, roofs are shaped more like bowls than you know triangles I guess you do have your triangular roofs but whatever so the the um, idea is to look at your roof as a bowl rather than a force field against the rain. <laughs> and so um, that's what that is. There's a triangle one. So the water runs down these gutters into the holding tanks and then you wash your, you know, it goes into your water cistern, which is in New Mexico, buried into the hill and insulated so it doesn't freeze. We obviously don't have that problem. And um, so what happens from there is that um, it goes through this thing, which is a water organization module, because Americans are paranoid about clean water. <laughs> and so, like, you know, in Nimbin, we just drink it straight out of the holding tank, you know, just, you know, just get rid of the ticks and whatever. <laughs> so, so basically, that's a 50 mesh filter on the end, which is a fairly big filter like with bigger holes it goes through your water pump which is pumped up through your 500 mesh fil filter your thousand mesh filter it goes down here to a steel uh, pressure tank it's got a diaphragm in it so it fills up and the diaphragm pushes the water back up and so it takes pressure off that pump you've got your ceramic drinking water and then that goes to all the taps in the house and what happens after that is you wash your body with it. I guess I'll just take you through the water path because that'll make it a lot easier. You wash your body with it, you cook your food with it, and then what happens after that? So I guess you've got all your grey water, all the beautiful uh, nutrients and things that come off your body. Your grey water goes into your botanical cell, which grows the food that you eat. So the food that you're growing is encoded with your DNA. So the seeds are picking up on these deficiencies that you have in your body and growing fruit that's beneficial to your natural ecosystem. So it's a really cool thing. It's like, I don't know if anyone's read the Ringing Cedar books here, but they talk about it in that, the Anastasia books. But um, anyway, what happens from that? That cleans the grey water, grows your food. At the end of the line, it's solar pumped up to your um, toilet that you know you poo in and you flush that poo down with the filtered grey water so that's your third use and then through an anaerobic system it pumps out to citrus trees or a black water botanical cell really great for your mold plants or whatever you want to grow and um, that's like your total closed cycle water treatment system that's um, a solar hot water system that's basically how it works you, you have your water tank, your solar hot water tank, which is, pumps the cold water up, which is heated from the sun, which comes back down into the tank, and obviously all the hot water rises. So at the top, you've got an outlet, which goes to your taps, and that's how you get your hot water. It's really simple, easy. In um, Australia, you're pretty much gonna have just uh, solar hot water systems with copper that gets heated up by the sun. In New Mexico they have glycol because it's, um, it freezes otherwise. Food production. So your food mileage living in one of these things is like that. <laughs> That's your food mileage. You don't have to go down to the shop, you don't have to go to the farm, you don't have to go anywhere. It's just there. And like literally you're sitting in your lounge room and you can reach over and grab a, you know, a bell pepper or whatever, if, you, if that's how you feel. And it's, uh, you know, it's great. It's, um, they had a, um, a thing where they tested the uh, Earthship food against the local organic produce. And the local organic produce store had three times the E. coli that the um, Earthship food had because it's not going anywhere. It's not exposed to all the poison, poison, <laughs> all the poison and stuff in the air and um, you know and you're eating it it's good tilapia which don't get here because it's a pest but you have your fish you know so it's like you can go fishing in your lounge room 
<laughs> you know, and then grab your peppers and your onions, you know, you cook it all up, you eat it, you shit in the toilet, and it goes and, uh, you know, it goes off and grows more stuff that you can enjoy after the meal. And, you know, it's a fully <laughs> closed system. It's great. Um, tomato security or tomato security, which um, Mike likes to call it. So basically what tomato security is, is um, if you can ensure that your neighbor has better to, uh, can grow better tomatoes than you, then if everything goes to the shit, they're not going to come and steal your tomatoes. So it's not about like, oh, you know, the British are coming or whatever. It's um, <laughs> they, um, trying to um, make sure that everyone is as well off and sustained and, um, you know, and happy as you are, if not more. And um, that's tomato security. Um, so this is all earth ship food, heirloom tomatoes, uh, silver beet, which they call spinach. And um, uh, what was the other one? Salandra. Which is, what's, what's Salandra again? Coriander. Coriander, that's right. <laughs> that's funny. And um, <laughs> you got salad, um, you know, beetroot. They showed this picture in China, everyone stood up and applaud. It's <laughs> a true story. And, um, you know, shiitake mushrooms growing from your, um, you know, you've got, um, you know, you can have like little tree stumps or whatever and, you know, Oyster. You got your artichokes, your eggplant, grapes, chili peppers, <laughs> watermelon, bananas growing in the middle of the desert when it's snowing outside from the poo water. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, cantaloupe or rock melon or whatever you want to call it. Chickens, they grow there. <laughs> And, um, you know, that's all tires and bottles and cans, that chicken coop. Uh, predatory wasps. If you don't want your predatory wasps, you can get little wands of pollinate if you want to be like, um, uh, you know, mimicking nature or whatever. Um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's inside the house, which is a really nice eating area next to the fish pond. Um, you know, it's just breathing with life. You walk in and, and the whole place is just breathing with life. It's not like stagnant when you walk into a lot of places. Um, contained, this is the last one, contained online sewage treatment. So we did, so after your grey water system, after your food, um, there's a really simple way that we did it, which I'll show you. I might actually, um, so that's how the grey water system works. Filters through the plants, Michael Reynolds at the end taking a poo, reading Coming of Wizards. And, um, you know, plants and all that. But I want to show you how we did the um, sewage system. This is basically how your regular plumbing system works. You know, it goes to your septic tank and your drain field out to your, you know, oceans where the turtles swim or whatever. So all we're doing is taking that same system, adding a couple of garden beds. And if you really don't give a shit about um, those waste transfer stations, you can take away that drain field and just add an extra botanical cell. Uh, Michael Reynolds has had this system for the last 30, 40 years. He's never had to have his toilet pumped. Uh, nothing like that. So, uh, yep, that's the bananas. <laughs> um, I want to show you guys. So that's just your black water system. You know, it attracts native life to the desert where, um, you know, where, I don't know how, that owl must have had to fly at least half an hour to get there. I don't know what the hell he was looking for, but he got there and he's taking a breather. <laughs> See, he's tired. Check it out. <laughs> so this is what we did, um, which is a system that Michael Reynolds uh, did in third world countries, which is a, the easiest, simplest, most effective uh, septic system I've ever seen. You dig a hole, you know, so just like with a jackhammer, shovels, uh, uh, what are those things called? Buckets. <laughs> and, um, you know, you take your dirt out, you line it with, um, we had rocky soil there. So if you have rocky soil, you line it with geofabric. If you don't have lo uh, rocky soil, you line it straight away with EPDM, which is pond liner. And then all it was, was rocks, uh, sorry, gravel, rocks, tires in the middle, and upside down bottles. So what we're trying to create is an anaerobic 
environment and an aerobic environment. So your bottles upside down are creating an air pocket so when the black water rises up, the, you know, the black water leaches out through the sides of the tyres, rises up the septic system, and when it goes through the bottles, it creates air pockets. So you've got this friction point between anaerobic and aerobic. And um, so it's really cool and it goes all the way up and comes out of this pipe. And it's just so cheap and so easy to do. And what we did was we primed the system. So this is something that we did extra is um, we prime the system with a Bokashi mix and with blood and bone. So we're treating the black water as a, um, uh, almost like a sourdough stock. <laughs> so we're priming it with Bokashi, which is um, EM and PDM7. EM is effective microorganisms, that's what it stands for. And we used a bottle because we thought about it at the last second. If we really prepared, we could have made the EM uh, during the build process. It takes three weeks just making it from crap and molasses and that sort of thing. And um, so we prime the system with that, with blood and bone. So then when you poo in there, the, that mixture ends up eating the poo and breaking it down quicker. And so you have a much faster breaking down process, less likelihood of needing to pump it. And that um, culture ends up growing and growing as it eats more poo. Sort of like, you know, any permaculture people here? Oh, so you know about Bokashi mixes and stuff. So, oh, I assume so, yeah. <laughs> but um, do, I think that's, I'm pretty sure that's it, actually. Um, I'll just get the, there we go. So if you want to contact me um, and, um, you know, get involved or anything like that, that's my email address. And, um, you know, it's all of us, the Terrain and crew and um, lock the gate. So make sure you keep locking your gates. Just because they've pulled out of New South Wales doesn't mean they're not going to be back. So you've got to keep feeding the master stock. Um, do we have any questions? How long does it take to make one of these houses? Because they all look different. And why do you assist the cost of the end? So I guess how long it takes, obviously, yeah, it depends on the size of it depends on how big you want it and that sort of thing. They've built some of these, if you have a big enough crew, they've built some of these. So the one in Guatemala was built in 12 days. And um, then you've got others that have taken years. So it depends on how efficient your crew is, how readily, like how much you've actually stored your materials and you're ready to go. Uh, if you're not building in a cyclone like we did. <laughs> and, um, and then, um, yeah, so basically, and obviously the smaller you build and the greater number of people you build, the quicker it's going to take. And I think that's where it's, it's going to get really exciting, sort of teaching people how to build smaller, easier kind of structures that you can build in like a week and get people in there. And at the same time, you're teaching people who then can teach more people. It ends up being like the bacteria that spreads in the Petri dish. Um, council approval. Oh, yeah. Uh, Interestingly, they, um, well, none have actually been passed through council in Australia yet. So I guess the way we look at the council thing is, um, you know, it's governed, I guess, with a whole bunch of uh, dogma and restraints from the building industry. So what we've decided to do is just kind of just sneak around that temporarily and um, create utopia so eventually when legislation gets its act together and realizes the necessity of structures like these the infrastructure will be already be there ready for them to walk into and claim credit so <laughs> yeah there's a guy called daryl taylor in king lake i think he's been waiting for about three years now and so, and that's in a fire, that's in a fire zone in King Lake. And so, um, you know, they should have just been like, you know, yeah, sure, here's my wife. You know, <laughs> they should have just let him walk into it. But it's taken so long because of that pre-learned dogma that they have to, you know, sort of think outside of the box. It's kind of like, you know, when you get a glass of water and it's filled with water and air, 
and you can't get more water in it. That's like the dogma. So they've got to kind of tilt the glass to the side to let the new information in. You had your hand up. Has one ever fallen down? Has one of them fallen down? <sighs> let me think. Actually, I think, but this is just word of mouth. In the Czech Republic, I think they did a build where they did the um, ferrous cement dome roof and they walked on it too soon. They didn't let it set long enough. And so then it just went <laughs> <laughs> But um, one that's already been built and finished, I haven't heard of one that's fallen down. As a matter of fact, there was a bushfire in New Mexico that cleaned out an entire village. And what ended up happening, the only house that survived was the earth ship and the tire structure, the tire stru uh, structure was still intact. All they had to do was build on from the tire structure. There'll be different things, like if you've got skill in some kind of area, it doesn't have to be carpentry or whatever, even if you're a, a healer or you're good at organising stuff, or whatever there is, there's a spot for you. As long as your, I guess, intention is in the right place and your goals are, um, I guess, with the planet in mind, there's a, there's a place for you. And so, and then there's other people who want to learn, who can pay to do workshop, and that's, I guess, how the project keeps funding itself. But then they get the freedom from that to go on and teach more people, and then it spreads that way. So the, the job, I guess, ends up being an integrated learning experience between agricultural systems, healing systems, habitat systems, uh, community systems, and just, um, you know, really, uh, working with the intelligence of loving. So that's, that's pretty much what's going on. Cool. Well, thank you so very, very much, Joey. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you all. <laughs>